Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now here's your host, David Hinojosa. Welcome to another edition of Good Books Radio. This is your host, David Hinojosa. My guest today is the cartoonist behind the popular geek webcomic Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial. His work has been featured in The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, Slate, Forbes, Science Friday, Boing Boing, The Freakonomics blog, The Radio Lab blog, Entertainment Weekly, Mother Jones, Discovery Magazine, among many other publications. And he's also the co-author of a new book titled Soonish, 10 Emerging Technologies That Will Improve and or Ruin Everything, which is what he's going to talk to us about today. My guest today is Mr. Zach Wienersmith. Zach, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, congratulations on your new book. Thank you. Thank you. It was, it was a lot of work, so uh, hopefully people like it. Yeah, it, it, it seemed like it was a lot of work. There's a lot of uh, uh, different uh, topics here, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. I found the, the content uh, very fascinating and very well organized. I really enjoyed that about the book. Uh, it's, uh, but before we get to that, you co-wrote this book with your wife, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, how did this idea happen? How did you come up with, you know, let's write about this? How, how did that come about? Yeah, yeah. Well, so we're both giant nerds, you know, and uh, so we, we like to read about, you know, technology and future stuff like a lot of people. And, um, you know, a lot of stuff is often misrepresented or misunderstood by the people reporting it in media. And, and I think mostly because it's just, it takes a lot of research to be able to say a small amount of stuff correctly. Right. So our thought was, well, it'd be fun to really dig into some of these exotic technologies and see what the actual deal is, talk to actual people working on it now, and to you know read the technical books and see what's really going on. Because um, often, you know, if you, if you don't know what's really going on with one of these fields, it's very easy to be overly optimistic about how soon something will happen. Um, so that's kind of our general outlook. We We do try to be optimistic about a lot of these technologies. We also want people to be properly skeptical. Uh, with the information we provide, right, uh, and and you know that's uh, that's very well portrayed in the book. You know, you you, and that's what I want to talk to you about first. So uh, walk us through uh, a chapter of your book. Uh, what I mean by that is the way it's organized. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So what we try to do is we take each of ten technologies, and first we tell you what the basic deal is. Like, what is it? Um, and then we talk about where is it at the moment, like, so, you know, we interview people who are working in the field, we read recent papers and books on the topic, and, and try to see what's on, on the edge. Uh, and we talk about uh, um, why it could actually be really bad. Uh, so I, I think we can get into examples of that later, but it, it's, I think, fairly intuitive that most technologies, while they grant us the ability to do new things, necessarily grant us the ability to do bad things. Uh, and then we also talk about how it would be really great, um, what, what, what perhaps unexpected cool things some of these technologies might deliver on. But yeah, as you say, we try to be skeptical and we try to say what, what might go wrong. Right. And that's the nota bene part of the chapter, right? Like that's where you... Say. Oh, yes, you're right. Yes. Yeah, so, so for most of the chapters, we also provide what we call a nota bene, which is kind of like a little something we came across in our research that didn't quite fit in the broader framework of the chapter, but which was just awesome. Uh, so, right. so yeah, we have a bunch of those as well. That's awesome. So your book is divided into three main sections, uh, which each section has its own chapters. But uh, you have the first section is about the universe. The second section is about stuff. And the last section is about, you know, people or you know, it's titled you. Yeah. So um, I like to start with the first section. So one of the main the, the, the chapter about the space elevator really, really intrigued me. Could you tell us about this technology? Because I found it fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So the, the basic deal on a space, space elevator, if you want to visualize it, is imagine you are probably on the ocean, although it doesn't have to be, but, but most of the ideas are that it would be there. Uh, so you imagine you see something that looks like an oil rig, but it's not an oil rig. It's the bottom of a cable that extends up from it, a fairly thin cable. You wouldn't be able to see it from a great distance. But it extends up into the sky and goes out about 60,000 miles way off into space. And then at the top in most designs is what's called a counterweight, which is just a sort of big object at the other end. And the reason you have it there is, is for, you know, physics reasons that aren't worth going into right now. 
Uh Uh, It it keeps the whole thing spinning around the Earth, but not too fast or too slow, else the cable would wrap around the Earth. Um, And that would be, you know, sad. And the idea is you have this cable that you can climb up to space. And uh, so uh, without getting in too much depth, essentially what that does is it means when you climb up that cable, you can just beam energy. uh, And so the stuff you send up is mostly just cargo that goes to space. And the reason that's important is the current paradigm is you use rockets. And so if you look at a rocket, you're you're not really looking at something that's going to space, not most of it, because 80% of that rocket is just propellant. It's just fuel that gets burned up on the way up. And another 17% is the machine that gets thrown away in most cases. So only 3% of a rocket actually goes to space, and it's actually lower than that. For the Apollo missions out to the moon, it was more like 1.5%. So with the space elevator, you're just sending up cargo. It could be much cheaper. It would probably lower the cost by 95 to 99% uh, if it worked. Now, it, what's the current uh, price of, uh, you know, t- you talk about uh, the how much it is to carry a pound of stuff. To yeah, space. It's, it's about $10,000 per pound. Um, there, there is some variation within that, but, but $10,000 is, is a good way to think about it. We, we calculated that's about a dollar per apple seed sent to space. It's quite expensive. That's yeah. I, when I read that, I was like, "What? It's so so crazy." <laughs> yeah, I, I think that it's funny. Most people think that the limiting factor in space adventures uh, is technology, but it's not. It's cost. It's just incredibly expensive to get stuff away from Earth into space. Right now, do you think we'll see this in our lifetime? Space elevator? Uh, I I would not give it a high chance. I mean, unless there's some breakthrough. Uh, so, so the problem is, in order to build a cable that goes out to space, um. You know, you, if you imagine you've fallen over a cliff and someone is holding you up with the cable, uh, you know, if you've only fallen down a few feet, what matters to you is how heavy they are, right? Right. Uh, but if, if they've fallen down like a million feet, it matters to you how heavy the cable is. And you can imagine probably the cable is going to snap. You need a cable that's extremely lightweight and extremely strong and right. no conventional material you can imagine like titanium or Kevlar not gonna none of that's gonna do it right uh right. and uh uh so you have to have something really exotic and one candidate material is what's called carbon nanotubes yeah which are just these thin straw shaped molecules of carbon it just turns out they have these these incredible properties uh that they could be used uh, for a space elevator the problem is you need one long molecule a sixty thousand mile long molecule and the longest one we've ever made is about a foot and a half yeah. uh so so there's some work to be done. You can imagine a world where a market develops for longer nanotubes, but I don't know what it is. Uh, so unless something changes, it seems unlikely. Uh, there, there, there are other more plausible methods. Okay. Are, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about any of the concerns, aside from cost? What could be... Oh, what yeah. Could well, yeah. There's, there's, there's a very... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, what could go wrong with this? You know, what, what are some of the concerns that you have? Uh, yeah. So I, I would say that... The, 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 the biggest scary thing, so the chapter in general is about ways you could get into space more cheaply, make space more accessible to, uh, you know, smaller governments or private individuals. And so that sounds great. Uh, but there's this one problem that's very hard to deal with, which is Earth is at the bottom of what's called a gravity well. And all that means is that if you have a thing in space above Earth and you just let it go, it'll drop. And as it drops, it'll pick up a lot of energy, right? So this is, this is sort of intuitive. If you drop a penny on someone from five feet up, They'll be annoyed with you. If you drop it from the top of the Empire State Building, you might kill them. Um, and it's similar. If you, if you drop a, like, 50-ton piece of metal from space, it's like dropping a fairly large bomb uh, wherever it lands. So you can imagine a world where it's easy to put stuff in space. It's also a world where it's easy to make these kinetic weapons okay. or easy to, for, for a, a rogue actor to do something with them. So uh, the problem is that that's just Newtonian law, right? That's not human law that says that works. That's, that's Newton. So there's no way around it with, with any uh, conventional physics. We have to have some sort of legal or political framework. And, and I, I don't know about you, but my, my confidence in political legal framework at this particular second is not ample. Um, <laughs> so so, uh, so that, that is something that would have to be dealt with. Uh, and, and, you know, there are different proposals, like you have to limit the amount of stuff you could have in a certain orbit or something. Right. But there's not a great way to do it. Uh, so, so that that to me is the scariest thing that would come with cheap access to space. Right, and and what about maintenance? You also talk about how how expensive it will also be to maintain this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the problem with the, the cable to space. So I, I said earlier you have to have a sixty thousand mile long molecule. The reason is because any deviation from that structure 
weakens it, right? Mm-hmm. So, so you know, a lot of people might say, well, if it's only a foot and a half, that doesn't matter because we can weave it together. We could make a weave of these things. It turns out when you weave things together like that, you lower the, the strength of the cable uh, and also you introduce the possibility of mistakes in it. And, and of course, you know, a cable is only as good as its weakest point. And so if you're, if you're riding an elevator up to space on a cable and it snaps, uh, it's going to be really embarrassing. Uh, you're going right. to have a very bad day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, so, you know, that's, that's the danger to the individual. It actually turns out uh, people have simulated this. If the cable breaks, it probably wouldn't be dangerous to people down here. It would be like if you were swinging a sling around your head and it cut, it would just go flying off, which would be bad for the people on the space station, but we on Earth would be okay. Right. Well, that was, again, that was extremely fascinating to me just to read about it. And, you know, the, the, it's even uh, some people are contemplating this and they're trying to come up with ways, yeah. well, you know, yeah, cheaper it's, it's ways amazing. to get to space. Uh, I know, you know, just rockets and, and just alternative methods aside from rockets, rather. Um, the, the next thing I'd like to talk to you about, which I also found fascinating, is uh, programmable matter. Could you please tell us mm-hmm. what this is about? Sure. Uh, so the way we like to say it is, you know, you have all these devices in your house, right? You have a dishwasher, you have a coffee maker, you have a, a, a clock. But you also have this thing called a computer. And yeah. I, I think most people is intuitive. The computer is kind of distinct from the other stuff. And, and the way it's distinct is this that the dishwasher will always just wash dishes. The coffee machine will always just wash, uh, make coffee. Mm-hmm. The computer, in principle, can be any machine you can program it to be, right? So yeah. you know, if, you, if you took a computer from 1980 and you give it a program from the year 2050, as long as it fits in the memory bank, it can, in principle, be run. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this quality is called universality, right? The computer can run any uh, program. So there's this idea that, well, what if we could make universal matter uh, we can make stuff have that same quality of universality. So, like, you could have a chair that you can make turn into a table or turn into, you know, a, a, a TV or whatever. Like, it could be literally anything. Right. Um, so that sounds pretty far out, and it, it is pretty far out, but there are some sort of incremental versions of it that might be interesting. Uh, so one that seemed to us pretty plausible was out of MIT. It's called, um, well, a couple places now. It's called Origami Robots. Yeah. The idea is, you know, we talked about universality. If you think about origami, what it is is that you take a piece of paper, but that piece of paper can become many things, right? It, it, it's just a sequence of folds, almost like you're entering codes in a computer. You just do a sequence of folds, and you get a crane, or you get an airplane, or something else. Um, so the idea is if you could take something like a piece of paper, like a flat surface, and then you make folds in it that have little actuators, little sort of elbow joints that can bend themselves, and, and then locking systems to maintain the fold. Mm-hmm. You can in principle have this little thing that looks like a piece of paper, and then you say, piece of paper, turn into a horse, and it'll do the origami folds to become a horse. Um, so that's a really cool approach, and then there, are, there, there are potential values to it beyond making horses. Uh, uh, there are potential medical applications. You can imagine little nanobots that reconfigure to perform medical operations, and, and that's something people are starting to work on now. Okay. Could could you tell us a little bit um, on that? You know, what type of medical uh, applications? Can this sure, have? sure. I'd love to. Uh, there's a woman named Daniela Roos who runs a lab at MIT, and they have this idea. So there's this uh, kind of kind of amazingly, there's this problem in the U.S. About three thousand of us every year uh, uh, come to a doctor because there is a watch battery stuck in our gut. Uh, I uh, <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, there's a subset of the population, hopefully mostly children, who eat watch batteries. Um, but anyway, so, you know, as you might imagine, in order to get that watch battery out of it, it's really large. Uh, the only way is to, to do surgery, and that's a really tough surgery, right, because you're, you're, you know, you could get um, septic problems because you're opening up someone's guts. Right. Uh, not to mention just surgery is not fun in general of any kind. So their idea is essentially you, you get uh, what I just described, a sort of origami robot that is folded up, and you have it in a pill made of ice. And then you swallow the pill, and what should happen is the robot – gets to the right place in your gut, uh, and, you know, it melts as it goes, and then it mm-hmm. configures itself into a shape where it can sort of swim, and it also should have, a, a you know, a magnet on it so it can grab the watch battery. So the idea is it hooks onto this watch battery, and it kind of swims away, pulling the battery out, and then uh, and then it just, uh, you know, makes its way out. Uh, and, right. uh, and, and that design, the robot, instead of being made of some fancy paper, would be made of sausage casing. So uh, even if it gets stuck, it should dissolve, uh, mostly dissolve out. Um, so, so that would be a, a cool early application. You can imagine a, a future where they can make much smaller versions of this that can perform, you know, much more delicate tasks than just pulling the watch batteries we all love swallowing out of our guts. 
Right, and, and has this been uh, you know applied already, or they? I mean, I, I know it's uh... no, it's it's still okay. it's still in in the testing phase. Most of the stuff we have in the book has not yet been applied. There's a couple things now that have been, but but mostly we're we're trying to look at medium term stuff. Okay. Oh well, I, again, you know, just programmable matter. I just thought it was great. I also uh, recall reading from a, like a bucket of a uh, bucket of stuff. I believe that you could just put your hand in and just if you need a wrench or if you need something, you know, for, for just for you to yeah. pull out something uh, to that shape, right? Yeah. So that's sort of the most the most advanced version of this. Uh, so the the, the the idea is what you would have is little tiny machines that can just do a couple things. They can move themselves around. They can lock onto other similar machines. They can maybe do a little sensing, possibly a little computing. But you don't want them to be too big if you want them to be able to be anything. You know, we, we talk about it like it's basically the T-1000, only it's, you know, it's not trying to kill you. It's, you know, folding your laundry or something or being a wrench. Uh, but um, but so it's, it's an extremely complicated problem, as you might imagine. There, there are versions of this. They're like the, the, the quote-unquote atoms, the, the little bits that are about a, a, a cubic centimeter, you know, about the size of a marble, uh, which, which is obviously not going to be super useful yet. But if you could really, 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 really miniaturize, there's some possibility you could have a sort of universal stuff. Uh, it, it actually turns out there might be sort of fundamental computational barriers to doing that, uh, but, but it remains to be seen. Okay. That, again, fascinating stuff. Uh, I mean, just... The idea of it, uh, it was just, uh, yeah. you know, very exciting. Um, uh, the other thing I liked to, that I found very interesting in your book was the chapter on bioprinting, which uh, yes. kind of rips off from what we were just talking about. So uh, could you tell us a little bit what that entails and where we are and, you know, any setbacks that we have at this point? On yeah, the... yeah. Uh, so if you've ever seen a 3D printer, you know, the basic way it works is there's a little nozzle and it extrudes. Uh, molten plastic and the plastic hardens and then you do that over and over and over and eventually you have a shape right um so one version of bioprinting is instead of plastic you use uh, a gel that has uh cells suspended in it so uh okay. loosely speaking the idea is you could build up something like a kidney by just laying down the cells right so a, a kidney is just an assemblage an extremely complicated one but an assemblage of you know cells and proteins and things so if you could just sort of spit them out you right. could develop a kidney. Uh, it turns out to be really, really complicated, as you, you might guess. Uh -huh. So one of the complications is that, um, you know, if you look at a liver, it just looks like a slab of brown gunk. But it turns out it's filled with this extremely complicated vasculature system, this, this highway for blood to get to all the little bits of the liver. Because if, those, if the body can't deliver nutrients and remove waste, then tissue dies, yeah. right? So if you, if, you, if you had a liver with no vasculature, what would happen is it would die from the inside out. Uh, you know, you, you could you could maybe deliver some blood to the outer edges if it was just soaking in nutrients, but that, that's about it. It wouldn't work in a human body. So you have to have some way to build this vascular, vasculature system. So a guy named Jordan Miller is doing this really cool project at Rice. He's doing a couple versions of this, but the, the idea is essentially you uh, do another kind of 3D printing where you uh, melt sugar into shapes. You have, you, if you imagine a sort of field of sugar, you blast it with a laser to make a flat shape, and then you put more powdered sugar over it, and then you blast it again. Eventually, you build up a three-dimensional structure. And so you can do this with sugar until you have the shape of veins, and then you spray veins on the exterior. Okay. And, and it turns out you can just get veins this way, uh, which would be really useful for, for building organs. Um, so, so that's another method. There's actually a great variety, but the essential goal is, is to be able to print body parts to order for people using their own cells. Uh, so that we can get all these, you know, people off of the transplant list and and back to their normal lives. Right. And how how far are we? Have, have any organs uh, been printed, or is this how advanced is uh, this technology? Is not 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 something like a kidney, but uh, is, remember we we said earlier that you need a complicated vasculature system. There's some things that don't, right? So if you if you have like a cornea. It's very thin, so you can just supply blood to it by diffusion, you know, like in the same way liquid moves through a sponge. Um, you can supply nutrients and remove waste. So, uh, so there's a company called Organovo that's working on thin stuff like that, uh, okay. and that's coming along. Okay. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, incidentally, this is not something we get into the book as much, but there's a, another emerging technology called uh, uh, cultured meat, uh, which, which also tries to make, you know, meat, but for human consumption that works along similar technological lines. So it, what's, what's interesting is there's a sort of convergence between these two goals of making plausible animal meat and making plausible human uh, organs. Um, so, so meaning what, what's nice is in this area of, of manufacturing tissue, there is now a lot of money coming into it. Uh, and there are some, as I said, early, early developments. But I, I 
you know, whether whether the next 30 years we'll we'll see a, a, a liver popped out of a machine to put in your body if you need it, uh, that's that's an open question. That's a that's trickier to predict. Right. Uh, this isn't the same thing as cloning, right? This is a completely different thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now, uh, which of these technologies, in your research, uh, which was the uh, technology that you were the most interested in? Uh, about which one was the one that you're like I'm glad I'm you know researching on this stuff. Oh, well, I the, the one that was really a lot of fun, although it was tricky, was um, brain computer interfaces, uh, okay. which are you know kind of what they sound like. It's, it's a way to connect a brain to your computer, either in, in in the simplest sense to use a computer to detect signals in your brain. In the future, maybe someday to be able to put signals into your brain, so maybe you know you could learn French in 10 seconds or something like that. But that, that's pretty far out. Uh, but but what's cool is uh, there's already some basic stuff we can do. We can tell if you're in a good mood or a bad mood. We can we can tell, like, uh, whether you're thinking about using a particular body part. Um, and some of that stuff already has medical applications. So, for example, uh, there's what's called deep brain stimulation, which is essentially an electrode in your brain. Uh, for people who uh, have severe psychological conditions or uh, – you know, uh, neurological problems that haven't responded to conventional treatments, you can have this electrode in your brain that uh, delivers uh, a regular output of electricity or, or delivers electricity in response to certain uh, cues. Uh, and, and apparently that does actually help with some uh, medical conditions that haven't responded to, you know, easier treatments. Right. Uh, but, so you know, you can imagine a future where we can detect all sorts of stuff. So one proposal we read, which I personally found terrifying, was apparently you can detect when people are daydreaming, uh, like when they lapse in focus. <laughs> so okay. one idea is if you're, you know, and, and you can imagine this is a kind of nightmare in the workspace, right? So it's like if you're, if you're, uh, a, you know, an office worker in a cubicle having a boss who can detect when you're kind of zoning out for a second. That to me that sounds pretty awful. <laughs> the, the good version of that is for things like you know a jet pilot or a surgeon or someone who you really you know would be valuable to them to be notified if they're drifting right. mentally. Uh, but but it, you know, you can see quickly it opens up a lot of scary privacy issues. Right, right, and and you mentioned those in in your book. I remember that, and uh, uh, you know, I never really thought about it until I read it. You know, it was just like, you know what, he's right. <laughs> um, now, <laughs> yeah, yes, it's it's freaky. It's especially freaky too because, and we talk about this a little in the book. The economics are kind of scary, right? So, right, you know, suppose this, this doesn't exist, but suppose someone comes up with a machine that you know makes you ten percent smarter, whatever that means, right? Uh, well, uh, suppose you refuse to do it. You're like, I'm not going to have a, a brain implant just to be smarter and be a better worker. Well, that's fine, but maybe someone else is willing to, and they're going to get the job. Uh, so we, we actually already see kind of a, an early version of this in, in academic studies. A high percent, I think like over 20% of elite American researchers admit to using brain-enhancing drugs. Right. Um, so there's already clearly a kind of arms race for what you're willing to do to, to do that top work. Um, so... Uh, yeah, <laughs> the terrifying possibilities uh, lurk in brain computer interfaces. Indeed, indeed. Now, in, in the last chapter, you make mention of uh, some technology that didn't make it to a chapter of the book, but you do, you know, make mention of them. Uh, is there a specific technology that did not make it to the book at all that you would have liked to include? Oh, tons. Uh, actually, we were just talking about we're probably going to release as a kind of bonus offering. We we did an entire chapter on nuclear fission. Um, like like you know, so when, when someone says nuclear power, this is what we're, they're talking about: nuclear fission. Uh, we wrote a whole chapter on on what the future of that might be like, uh, like sort of advanced concepts in nuclear fission, and we we ended up cutting it just for space reasons. Like we we literally uh, you know we, we had written too much, um, but it's actually it's really fascinating and it's and it, it's an important part of everyone's world, uh, and so it's it, it, it's uh, something I it would have been nice to be able to present to people. I, I think we're going to give it as an online offering. Uh, sometime fairly soon, but but yeah, that that one unfortunately had to hit the cutting room floor. It was especially unfortunate, I forgot, because we had a nota bene, a bonus section, uh-huh. where we described what was called Project Orion, which was a project in the late 50s, early 60s, used nuclear explosions to blast a spaceship up to space. Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> so it was really one of those like weird late 50s, early 60s projects that, that surely could never have passed uh, politically, but was it was nevertheless quite interesting. Right. Now, um, are there any future projects that you're working on, aside from what you just mentioned, anything else that we should uh, be expecting? Oh, yeah. I, 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 I have a controversial book, so I hesitate to mention that. In October, I'm putting out a book 
called um, with, with my co-author. I illustrated a book uh, called Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration, basically proposing a much more open immigration policy. Um, obviously, it's, it's, uh, you can tell from the title, it's a quite controversial perspective, but I think anyone interested in immigration will, will find it enlightening on the topic. That that's awesome. I will be on the on the lookout for that. Uh, lastly, uh, what do you uh, and Kelly uh, want for readers to take from this book? Uh, I, I guess what I would love for people to take away from this book is science is really amazing, uh, but but often the details get misrepresented. So it, you know, it, we we want them to kind of sort of be optimistic about the future, but be skeptical about what you hear. Do your research, and you will not only understand it better, but I think you will enjoy it more. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to add, Zach, before we leave? Uh, no, that's it. That was fun. <laughs> okay. Well, Zach, I want to thank you so much for talking with me today. I wish you the best with uh, this book, which uh, I believe is available now online and through all major retailers. And uh, it's a great read this summer. Thank you so much for, for taking time. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Have a good one. Likewise. I've been talking with Zach Wienersmith about his new book, Soonish, 10 Emergent Technologies That Will Improve or Ruin Everything. I'd like to remind you that if you missed our regularly scheduled broadcast, you can always listen to our interviews on our YouTube channel, Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. This is your host, David Hinojosa, signing off. Thank you for listening.